Hi, it's Katrina, the Pharaoh's Medallion. There is said to be a mysterious Pharaoh's Medallion that once belonged to the great ruler Akhenaten. You may remember him as King Tut's father and the Pharaoh that changed the entire religion of Egypt to worship one god, the sun. The reason the medallion is so mysterious is that it seems to depict the pharaohs being ruled over by aliens. There is what appears to be a great big UFO in the center of the medallion, some kind of oblong-headed alien overlord at the very top of it, and at the bottom are some pharaohs along with gods like Ra and Anubis. The suggestion of the medallion is that the Egyptians knew very well that aliens existed. If true, it would lend some credit to the theory that aliens did have something to do with the Egyptians building their pyramids and other amazing structures. It could also mean that aliens had a real influence over other ancient cultures as well. But there is a reason that this is a controversial discovery. Nobody actually knows if the medallion even really exists. Was this really something commissioned by the pharaoh Akhenaten? He is depicted quite strangely in many works of art, with spindly legs and arms, and a large protruding belly, and large head with big almond eyes. His appearance has made many question if he actually was an alien. Unfortunately, no one knows where the medallion is, who actually discovered it, or if it's all just a hoax perpetrated by pseudo-archaeologists. The reality is that it appears as though Pharaoh Akhenaten had a genetic mutation which caused his brain to grow far larger than normal. Based on his looks, his strange DNA, and odd behavior, this pharaoh remains quite the enigma. Monsters on Crete On the Greek island of Crete, archaeologists discovered controversial footprints that suggest some kind of humanoid creature was roaming around 6 million years ago. To understand this controversial discovery, we need to look at the human foot. It is exceptionally distinct. One of the defining characteristics of a human being is the foot. So when scientists on Crete found fossilized footprints of a creature with feet that look shockingly similar to ours, it was quite the surprise. The footprints were made by something walking on two legs. In total, there were 29 prints ranging in size. It was almost the same as ours, except they didn't have enough toes. There's a big toe and then three smaller toes with a heel on the other side. If you didn't actually stop to count the toes, you would think it was a normal person's print. Carbon dating determined the age of the footprints to go back 5.6 million years. This doesn't make sense for a lot of reasons. The cradle of humanity is supposed to have been in Ethiopia. How human-like creatures could have made it out of Africa and all the way to Greece before branching out to the rest of the world would completely change history. What kind of creature was this anyway? It remains a mystery. Whether it was a primitive humanoid, ape, dinosaur, lizard, human, hybrid, who knows? The truth about Pluto. When it comes to astronomical discoveries, nothing gets people going these days quite like Pluto. More controversial than its discovery 90 years ago was its removal from the list of planets. But just what is Pluto and why is it the most controversial space rock in the solar system? It was originally discovered by Clyde Tombaugh. Then in 2003, a slightly larger planet than Pluto was found beyond Neptune in a region that contains trillions of small icy rocks. And here's where the controversy comes in. Pluto is still thought of as a planet by a lot of planetary scientists. It was the International Astronomical Union that reclassified Pluto as a dwarf planet, not technically a planet like Earth or Mars. And yet Pluto still has moons like any other planet. It just so happens to be at the edge of the solar system, in an area where there are billions and billions of similarly sized chunks of rock. And so scientists had to make a call. They had to define what's just a big rock and what is a planet. Half of the scientists decided that Pluto would be the line in the sand. It was too small to be a proper planet. However, the other half of scientists still to this day believe Pluto deserves its place on our list of planets. Which side of this debate are you on? Is Pluto a planet or is it just a really big rock? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Big Brains a controversial study has proposed a new theory as to how humans developed our big, smart brains. 
For a bit of background, our brains grew as if they had been taking steroids between 2.6 million and 11,700 years ago. During this brief window of time, and up until very recently, our brains were developing more rapidly than just about any other creature on the planet. Scientists working with the Tel Aviv University believe the reason for this sudden explosion of growth has to do with our hunting style. According to the scientists, as humans hunted the largest animals around, eventually bringing them to the brink of extinction, we found ourselves running out of food. Our earliest ancestors specialized in taking down big animals like bison and elephants. These creatures would have provided great fatty meals. But as we killed them all, humans were forced to resort to catching smaller prey. This meant we needed more brain power to catch smaller, more clever animals. The humans who were good at hunting these smaller creatures had larger brains with more brain power. So the brainiacs had more babies and passed on their big brain genes. This is at least what the new theory suggests. It's controversial because there is no way to prove it. All we know for sure is that the human brain expanded from 40 cubic inches 2 million years ago to 92 cubic inches 10,000 years ago. That is a shocking amount of growth. And wait until you hear this. Scientists say that brain size since farming started has gone down to 80 cubic inches. We've actually lost 12 cubic inches of brain since agriculture began. The Tomb of Jesus there are three tombs in the world where Jesus was supposedly buried, but which of these controversial tombs is the real one, if any? The story goes that after Jesus of Nazareth was crucified, his body was placed in a tomb. But when they went to check on his body later, he was gone. Three days after he was dead, he came back to life or was resurrected. That's the way the story goes. But the truth is that there are three tombs in Jerusalem that are all claimed to be the place where Jesus was originally buried. There's the Talpiot family tomb just outside the old city of Jerusalem. It was discovered in 1980 with 10 ossuaries within. Some of the tombs bear names such as Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. It's been suggested that Mary Magdalene was also buried here, next to Jesus who was, according to some, her husband. But that's a whole different controversy for another day. Then there's the Garden Tomb, originally put forth as Jesus' resting place in 1883. This is the most popular spot where evangelical Christians come to see the place where Jesus was buried. However, the guy who actually found this tomb was not very reliable. It was even said that the Ark of the Covenant was found nearby and then stolen. And finally, there's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Before the church was ever built, there was an ancient Jewish cemetery that stood just outside the walls of Jerusalem at the time that Jesus died. There is archaeological evidence to confirm this. However, it's still impossible to say whether Jesus truly did get entombed here, or one of the other two spots believed to have been the site of his burial. Fetuses and Memory A new study has shown that fetuses can remember things. Scientists have found that at 30 weeks old, a fetus has developed short-term memory. If there had been any debate about whether fetuses were conscious or not, this really settles it. According to Live Science, researchers tested the fetuses in 100 pregnant women. They wanted to figure out at what age memory starts and how long the memories can last. They exposed the fetuses to vibroacoustic stimulation, in other words, a very low sound that causes vibration. They observed the reaction of the fetuses using ultrasound machines. What they discovered was that a fetus would get used to the sound after hearing it enough times. At first, they would react badly to the sound, but after hearing it over and over, they just got used to it. Scientists saw that at about 30 weeks and beyond, the fetus would remember that specific stimulus and not react badly. To summarize the results of the study, Fetuses at 30 weeks old can remember things for a full 10 minutes. At 34 weeks, fetuses are able to remember things for up to 4 weeks. The first noodle There is a lot of controversy surrounding the noodle. Back in 2005, there was an announcement in the scientific Nature magazine talking about the remains of noodles being found at a Neolithic archaeological site in China. The news circulated around the globe sparking a fierce debate between the Chinese, the Italians, and the Arabs over who invented the noodle first. And as it turns out, that award goes to the Chinese. 
The discovery of the oldest noodle came from a site called Lagia, which has been compared to Pompeii in Italy. It's a famous ancient city that was abandoned after a brutal earthquake and a flash flood. The flood managed to preserve this city almost perfectly. When excavations began in the early 2000s, archaeologists found strands of noodles from at least 2000 BC. These noodles were created using the traditional method of lamian, of stretching each strand by hand. This technique is still used in China today. The reason everyone got so angry is that each culture wanted to believe they were the inventor of the noodle. The Italians are no longer able to say that it was them who invented spaghetti. In fact, it was the Chinese roughly 4,000 years ago. The Bust of Nefertiti The Bust of Nefertiti is a painted statue displaying the royal wife of the pharaoh Akhenaten. It's believed that the bust was carved in 1345 BC by Tutmos, the most legendary Egyptian craftsman. After all, it was found in his workshop. The bust has gone on to be one of the most replicated pieces of work from ancient Egypt. It also helped turn Nefertiti into one of the most famous women of the ancient world. The statue was originally discovered by a team of German archaeologists led by Ludwig Borchardt in 1912. Ever since its discovery, it's been kept solely in Germany. It's been displayed at several different German museums and is currently sitting in Berlin. The reason it's such a controversy is that Egypt has been trying to get it back for a decade. It's been part of an intense argument between the two countries because Egypt demands the statue back as reparation. Egypt began demanding the statue back 12 years after it was taken by the Germans, once it became a wildly famous artifact. But Germany refuses to give it back. It's part of some bizarre protocol. Because the German excavator signed a deal with the Egyptian antiquities services at the time, the Germans technically own it. But just how long are these kinds of deals valid for? It's been nearly 100 years since the paper was signed, and at the time no one even knew it was a bust of Nefertiti. Should Germany be allowed to keep an artifact that they took from another country? Or should they have to give it back? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Animal Evolution A new fossil may have just pushed the theory of animal evolution back 100 million years or more. As you may already know, our planet has existed for at least 4.5 billion years. And throughout the life of Earth, physical life has existed continuously. For most of the Earth's history, that life was bacteria. The big question scientists have always wanted to answer is this. When did animals as we know them today first appear? Scientists now know that organisms began to grow shells, exoskeletons, and become animals about 540 million years during the period known as the Cambrian Explosion. This was when diverse and complex animals with hard body parts suddenly exploded onto the scene. However, scientists have no idea what happened before these animals existed. There is no fossil evidence of creatures without hard body parts. The catch-22 is that animals with hard body parts must have evolved from animals with squishy body parts that scientists have never been able to find. In northern Canada, a geologist and paleobiologist just discovered a microstructure that's nearly 900 million years old. It seems to show a type of sponge creature many hundreds of millions of years older than creatures from the Cambrian explosion. The reason this is controversial is that it could push back the creation of animals to nearly a billion years before today, or further. If this goes far enough back, it could prove that Earth has harbored complex life for almost all of its existence. Crucifixion Nails there are two iron nails that, depending on who you ask, were used 2,000 years ago to nail Jesus to the cross. These nails have been controversial artifacts forever. The nails were found in an unmarked box in the collection of a dead Israeli anthropologist named Niku Haas. According to the Israel Antiquities Authority, Haas took the nails from a tomb that he excavated in the 1970s. However, there are no records that say which tomb the nails come from. Then, in 2011, there was a controversial documentary suggesting that the nails came from the Caiaphas tomb, from the tomb in which a high priest involved with the crucifixion of Jesus was buried. It's said that the priest felt so guilty about crucifying Jesus that he kept the nails as a weird souvenir. 
It's obviously quite difficult to prove beyond any doubt that the nails were used to crucify Jesus. But according to geologist Arye Shimron, there is some proof that they could be the real deal. By doing some analysis, scientists found that the nails contained slivers of wood and bone. This means they were almost certainly used in a legit crucifixion. They were also dated back to around the year 33 AD, which is the time when Jesus was crucified. No one can say for sure if the nails were used in the crucifixion of Jesus, but they were definitely used in the crucifixion of someone at around the same time. Deformed Skulls When Rome collapsed during the 5th century, the empire swiftly abandoned its territories in the Pannonia region of what is now Western Hungary as the conquering Huns invaded Central Europe. In the meantime, foreign groups traveled to Pannonia seeking refuge and joined the localized Roman settlements. These rapidly changing population dynamics caused a cultural shift that today's experts are still trying to understand. Since 1961, dozens of deformed skulls have been unearthed from a cemetery in the region. Out of 96 burials, 51 bore evidence of a practice called skull binding, which involves artificially stretching a person's head throughout their childhood by tightly wrapping it. This permanently altered the skull into what we often think of as an alien-like appearance. This extreme tradition of body modification dates back to the Paleolithic era. It spread throughout Asia during the 2nd century BC and thereafter made its way across Europe. The graves represent three distinct groups and span three generations, from 430 AD until the site was abandoned in 470 AD. An isotope analysis of the bones showed that some of the later burials were occupied by people who were from the immediate area and had lived there under Roman rule, while others migrated there after being displaced elsewhere. These groups had noticeably different burial customs, yet all three practiced skull binding, reflecting its spread across cultures. They used different binding techniques further indicating that it was one of several cultural practices that were exchanged between the groups as they learned to cohabitate with one another. Did you know that skull binding and skull modification was so popular? Let me know in the comments! Sacrificed Woman Looking deeply into cultures where rites and rituals included human sacrifice is always disturbing. The rituals and history of the Moche culture include many creepy and disturbing revelations. The mysterious moche flourished from roughly 100 to 800 AD in what is now Peru. Human sacrifices were a regular occurrence for the moche people. At a five-story tall site infamously known as the Temple of Doom at the Cao Viejo site, warriors were offered to the gods in a particularly gruesome way. Their throats were slit and their blood was poured into a goblet for a priest, who then drank it down. Murals at the site dating back 1,700 years depict these sacrificial victims, leading experts to believe that only male warriors were sacrificed. But that belief changed in 2013, when archaeologists uncovered the tomb of a woman who appears to have been sacrificed by the moche. She most likely died either by ingesting a toxic substance or was strangled with a cord, and was just 17 to 19 years old at the time. The woman was buried face down with her head facing west and her arm extended toward the sea. The discovery builds on previous findings that challenged long-held beliefs about the role of women in Moche culture. In 2006, the mummified remains of a female Moche leader were found inside an elaborately painted burial chamber at Cao Viejo. Discoveries like these prove that we still have a lot to learn about the Moche and other pre-Columbian cultures in the Americas. 15th Century Witch Prison 23 women and one man were tried and executed for witchcraft in Aberdeen during Scotland's Great Witch Hunt of 1597, roughly 30 years after the country's transition from Catholicism to Protestantism. In 2016, historians identified evidence of this dark chapter of the city's past in the form of a chapel that they believe served as a prison for detained suspected witches. All that remains of the makeshift holding center is a two-inch wide iron ring embedded on a stone pillar of the St. Mary's Chapel of St. Nicholas, which doesn't seem like much. Arthur Winfield, who led a project to restore the chapel for the Open Space Trust, told the Daily Mail that the ring seemed so insignificant he was skeptical that it was anything more than a piece of metal in the wall. 
but the history that goes along with the ring, and the building itself, is more than slightly disturbing. Aberdeen's archives reveal that the ring was installed specifically for chaining up the accused while they awaited their unfortunate fates. The frigid chapel was the suspect's last stop before they were executed and burned. Detailed records list the supplies that were needed for the gruesome campaign, including tar barrels, rope, stakes, shackles, and peat for burning. The city meticulously recorded the details of each suspect, who likely died as a result of baseless superstition rather than valid allegations. St. Mary's Chapel originally served as a refuge for Catholic women to pray, but following the Reformation in 1560, it was converted into two sanctuaries. The church's use changed yet again when King James VI of Scotland ruthlessly embarked on the Great Witch Hunt. St. Mary's went on to house the city's gallows and served as a soup kitchen for some time. Archaeologists found the remains of over 2,000 people at the site, but none of the accused witches, who were likely buried elsewhere on unhallowed ground. Ancient Pet Cemeteries Most of us are familiar with the horror writer Stephen King and the infamous story Pet Cemetery, later made famous in the 1989 movie of the same name. The idea of burying dead pets has always provoked some creepy feelings. This, apparently, has long been a human behavior. The modern-day Peruvian capital of Lima sits upon layers of past settlements dating back thousands of years. Here and elsewhere throughout the country, archaeologists have uncovered numerous graveyards containing the remains of both people and dogs, as well as sites dedicated exclusively to canines. These cemeteries date back between 900 and 1350 AD, when the region was inhabited by a pre-Columbian agricultural civilization called the Chiribaya. Often buried with toys and blankets, the dogs were laid to rest in separate plots next to the burials of deceased humans, showing that the culture highly valued man's best friend. The ancient people of Peru used their canine companions for herding llamas, and it appears as though humans and dogs were occasionally sacrificed. One particularly bizarre site, discovered underneath the Lima Zoo by archaeologist Karina Venegas Gutierrez, is filled with human remains bearing signs of torture and violence, showing that they suffered gruesome deaths. The dog skeletons lack these marks, suggesting that they were ritually strangled. As of 2015, scientists were working on trying to prove a genetic connection between the dogs of the past and a modern-day Chiribaya shepherd. But other types of dogs have been found at these cemeteries, including a small bulldog-like breed and dogs that still roam the country's streets today. Would you want to be buried with your dog? Or do you think pet cemeteries are creepy? Let me know in the comments! Notre Dame Crypt The April 2019 fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris put the historic building out of commission for an extended period. Even parts of the structure that were not damaged in the blaze had to close, including the archaeological crypt that sits beneath the courtyard, which was covered in toxic lead dust, mold, and debris. Cleaning crews spent over a year restoring the crypt, which finally reopened in September. It was first made accessible to the public in 1980 and is considered one of Paris's hidden gems, according to Smithsonian Magazine. Occupying over 19,000 square feet of space, it is the largest crypt in Europe. Numerous artifacts were discovered in and around the crypt during excavations between 1965 and 1970. Included amongst them are a docking port from before the city became Paris and was still known by its Gallo-Roman name, Lutetia, remnants of Roman public baths, 4th century ramparts, a medieval chapel basement and road, and the remains of a 19th century sewage system. Notre Dame attracts millions of visitors annually, but many people visit the cathedral without ever knowing about the discreet crypt, which is marked by an inconspicuous side entrance that easily goes unnoticed. In fact, Elaine Schiolino pointed out in a Smithsonian Magazine article that not many people showed up on the day of the crypt's reopening. Eerie Shipwreck Imagine a ghostly shipwreck that reveals itself from time to time, only to disappear back into the sand and waves. The ruins of the SV Karl, a German ship that ran aground off the Cornish coast during World War I, reappeared in late 2019 during low tide following a violent storm. The British Navy was towing the 60-foot, three-masted, steel-hulled sailing vessel to London in 1917, 
with plans to dismantle it for scrap metal when it became stuck on a reef during a storm and broke away from its tow line. Tugboats made two attempts to refloat the ship after salvage experts noticed that the hull seemed undamaged. But their efforts were in vain, and the SV Carl was ultimately declared a loss and abandoned in place. Shortly thereafter, it became buried in sand. Late last year, the long-buried ship briefly emerged from the sand, giving people an opportunity to catch a glimpse of the ghastly wreck. This isn't the first time that the ship has revealed itself to beachgoers. It often appears during winter, when storms wash away the sand covering it, according to Cornwall Live. But the vessel is never exposed for long before the sands wash back over it, reconcealing it. The sand has helped to preserve the SV Carl, which is in surprisingly good shape for its age. It's just one of an estimated 6,000 shipwrecks along the 250-mile Cornish coastline. What do you think of this disappearing and reappearing wreck? Pretty cool? Pretty creepy? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe for more amazing and creepy archaeological content. A Crash from the Past The shipwreck of the SV Carl isn't the only relic of the past that has a habit of disappearing, only to reappear later. In September 1942, during World War II, a U.S. fighter plane went down off the coast of northern Wales. The pilot, 24-year-old 2nd Lieutenant Robert F. Elliott, crash-landed the Lockheed P-38 Lightning fighter during a gunnery practice mission. Thankfully, Elliott walked away from the wreck unscathed, but he was tragically reported missing in action several months later. Following the crash, the downed aircraft was buried in 6.6 .6 feet of sand. It reappeared several times over the years when the water washed the sands away, including during the 70s, in 2007, and again in 2014. Late last year, government officials announced that the plane was given protected status, making it the UK's first legally designated military aircraft wreck conserved for its historic and archaeological value. While this and other lingering World War II wrecks that have reappeared in recent years serve as eerie reminders of the dark time in the world's history, these wartime landmarks also have sentimental value to the relatives of soldiers who served in wars. My uncle was among those brave and expert fighter pilots who served with distinction during World War II, Elliot's nephew Robert Elliot said in a statement following news of the plane's protected status. My visit to the site with my wife Kathy in 2016 was very moving and emotional. China's Hanging Coffins In southern China, there is a man-made cave containing dozens of hanging coffins suspended as high as 165 feet in the air. Weighing over 220 pounds each, the oversized caskets are all either wedged between rock openings or hanging from wooden stakes. They were put in their places as far back as 1,200 years ago by the ancient Bo people as part of a religious ritual of some type. A handful of the coffins are torn up, which experts believe happened during the 1960s when someone discovered the site, failed to report it to the authorities, and used the wood as firewood. This is just one of several such cemeteries throughout the region, some of which date as far back as 3,000 years and house coffins up to 300 feet in the air. One site in the Gizu province is littered with an array of ancient artifacts, including clothes, bones, and ceramics. Some researchers speculate that laying the dead to rest in a hard-to-reach place blessed them and prevented animals from feeding on their remains. Others theorize that the elevated sites were seen as a way to get the deceased closer to heaven. How the ancient people transported the caskets to their final resting place is also unknown, considering how difficult they are to get to even now with modern equipment and technology. The Bo civilization itself is shrouded in mystery as well. Experts believe that they were persecuted and mostly disappeared amid the onset of the Ming dynasty in the late 14th century, save for a few who likely assimilated into other local minority groups. New Forest Arbor Glyphs Recently, it's been more difficult, and arguably more dangerous than ever before, to travel to various landmarks, monuments, and other historic and archaeological sites around the world. As a result, many organizations are turning to the internet so that people can visit virtually. In October, England's New Forest National Park Authority, or NPA, displayed over 100 examples of historic tree etchings called arbor glyphs on its website. The free digital display features an interactive map leading visitors to different carvings, some of which date back centuries, 
perhaps even as far back as Shakespeare's time. While the NPA embarked on the project in order to record images that are fading and distorting with time, it also offers a convenient way to stave off quarantine boredom. The tree graffiti consists of initials, names, dates, government markings, and witchcraft symbols. One of the most commonly spotted etchings is of something called the King's Mark, which was used for labeling trees as crown property for shipbuilding during the early 19th century. Not all the marked trees were used, however, because steel and iron eventually replaced timber as primary shipbuilding materials, hence why forest visitors can still spot the King's Mark today. Trees bearing concentric circles were likely marked by witches, who used the symbol as a way to ward off evil spirits. U.S. service members also carved proof of their presence into the bark during World War II. Although the carvings are a long-standing tradition in the forest, park staff strongly caution visitors against leaving their own mark, as the practice now is against the rules. Iron and Steel The advent of iron was a game-changer when it came to the advancement of technology during ancient times. People in parts of Africa and Asia first discovered its usefulness around 1500 BC, when they started harvesting it from the ground and making tools and weapons with it. 500 years later, cultures throughout Europe began catching on. Warfare helped the use of iron spread even further, particularly among the Celts who were known for their high-quality weapons. Iron made life a lot easier at a time when people didn't live very long. It came in especially handy when it came to farming, with tools like iron sickles and plows working much more efficiently than what people used before. With iron, farmers could work tougher soils and it cut their working time so that they were free to do other things. Many people spent this newfound free time making trade goods such as salt, clothing, and jewelry. The development of steel-making technology was a groundbreaking feature of the Iron Age. Made with iron and carbon, steel is much harder than just iron, and it made very durable weapons. Most research put the end of the Iron Age at around 550 BC, but it varies by region. The rise of the Vikings around 800 AD marked the end of the period in Scandinavia, and in Western and Central Europe, the Iron Age ended around the same time that the Roman Empire fell during the first century BC. From the Iron Age up until the Industrial Revolution, the iron and steel-making processes and the tools that were manufactured stayed mostly the same. Mixing of hominids Between 40 and 60,000 years ago, our ancestors got down and dirty with two closely related related hominid species, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. In fact, the only people on the planet who don't have any Neanderthal DNA in them are from Africa. But figuring this out didn't bring scientists anywhere close to fully understanding our evolutionary history. A study that came out last year found that the Neanderthals and Denisovans interbred with a mysterious population of ancient hominids in Eurasia roughly 700,000 years ago. This super archaic species diverged from other humans around 2 million years ago and numbered somewhere between 20,000 and 50,000 individuals. During this period, ancestors of modern humans separated from the ancestors of Neanderthals and the Denisovans, and large-brained hominids emerged in Europe and Asia. Scientists drew these conclusions by examining DNA from these archaic populations, as well as modern Africans and Europeans. At its most basic level, the research shows that human populations mated far more often than scientists previously thought, according to anthropologist Alan Rogers. It's the latest of many discoveries in recent years that present more questions than answers, but it still gets us one step closer to untangling the complicated web of our collective past. Troy and the Trojan Horse were real Ancient Greek philosopher and poet Homer wrote about the Trojan War in his epic poem The Iliad, but he failed to mention the Trojan Horse. According to the Aeneid by fellow ancient Greek Virgil, the decade-long series of conflicts ended when Odysseus ordered his army to build the famous structure. Some of the best Greek soldiers crammed into the hollow vessel, and Odysseus fooled the Trojans into thinking it was a peace offering. Once inside the city walls, the Greeks emerged from the wooden horse and ravaged the Trojans, securing their victory in the seemingly endless war. 
For a long time, experts believed that Troy was a mythical place dreamt up in Homer's mind. German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann proved them wrong during the late 19th century, when he found and excavated much of the city in modern-day Turkey. This discovery posed a new question. How much of the stories about the Trojan War are true? Even after Troy's existence was proven, many scholars continue to doubt that there was ever really a Trojan horse. They thought that Virgil's reference to it was metaphorical in nature, perhaps relating to a natural disaster or a war machine, but not a big, clunky, literal wooden horse. Fast forward to this year. Archaeologists at Troy began digging up dozens of strangely positioned wooden planks, with each beam measuring up to 49 feet long. The structure fits Virgil's description of the Trojan horse, and radiocarbon dating revealed that it was built sometime during the 12th or 11th century BC, which falls in line with the recorded dates for the Trojan War. So, is it the Trojan horse? Scientists haven't confirmed it, but all signs point toward this being the case. And it kind of makes you wonder if there are any other true stories out there that experts are mistakenly labeling as mythical. Atlantis, perhaps? Arctic Dinosaurs The world was much warmer 70 years ago than it is now, but the polar region still saw below freezing temperatures and snowy winters. Believing that dinosaurs couldn't survive in these frigid conditions, scientists long assumed that the creatures never stayed in these areas year-round. But they recently proved themselves wrong with the discovery of fossils from seven dinosaur species that were found as far north as 250 miles above the Arctic Circle. Some of the fossils are of eggs, suggesting that dinosaurs spent the winter in the region. Evidence of polar dinosaurs has also appeared in the Southern Hemisphere. These findings challenge the long-standing notion that all dinosaurs were cold-blooded. In order to survive in the Arctic, a species had to be at least somewhat warm-blooded, meaning that they were capable of warming their bodies enough to survive months of darkness and cold. Scientists are still piecing together the picture of what life was like for polar dinosaurs. It would have been especially hard for those really close to the poles, where darkness set in for six months every year and plant life ground to a halt. The condition would have possibly created a food crisis for any animals living there, unless they relied on a survival strategy that experts haven't identified yet, which, as things currently stand, seems entirely possible. So, how do you think these Arctic dinosaurs lived and survived close to the poles? Were they warm-blooded? Were they hibernating? Or do you think there's a different answer to this mystery? Let me know in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We've got lots more videos coming up. The early human that wasn't. In 1912, an amateur archaeologist named Charles Dawson claimed that human-like fossils were found in East Sussex, England. The country's top paleontologist announced that the newly discovered bones constituted a previously unknown human ancestor who lived around 500,000 years ago. Experts described the species as the link between humans and apes. These claims were turned on their head in 1949, when new technology showed that the remains were no more than 50,000 years old. By then, modern Homo sapiens had already emerged into existence, meaning that the Piltdown Man, as he had come to be called, couldn't possibly represent a missing link between us and apes. Further investigation proved that the fossils were bones from two different species, a human and an ape of some sort, perhaps an orangutan. And the artifacts had been stained to look like they matched the gravel at Piltdown. Soon enough, the verdict was in. The Piltdown man was nothing more than an elaborate hoax. But why would someone go so far out of their way to lead science astray from fact? The first evidence that humans evolved in Africa came in the form of Homo erectus fossils that were discovered there in the late 19th century, shortly before the Piltdown Man appeared. But pervasive racism made many Europeans feel threatened by the growing body of evidence supporting this claim. By creating the illusion of the Piltdown Man, Europeans could claim that Britain played a prominent role in human evolution and that white people had evolved separately from black people. This is a huge problem in archaeology and history in general that is recorded by the victor and the most powerful people in society at the time. So when things don't go their way, they tend to twist or quash the truth. Many modern scholars argue that this is why people don't believe that ancient people could have been smart, and so amazing things from the past must have been created by aliens. Women could be Viking warriors. 
Sometime during the mid-10th century, a high-ranking Viking military leader died and was laid to rest with two horses and an array of deadly weapons in what is now Birka, Sweden. When the grave was excavated in 1889, archaeologists simply assumed the individual was a man. But in 2014, osteologist Anna Kjellström noticed that the skeleton had delicate hip bones and feminine cheekbones. In 2017, a DNA analysis proved that the person was actually a female, an elite professional warrior who also happened to be a woman. She was at least 30 years old when she died and was around 5 feet 6 inches tall, which was tall for a woman of the time. In addition to her weapons and horses, the burial contained a board game complete with playing pieces. Some experts think that this may symbolize her role as a war strategist, but not all researchers agree on this or on the woman's role in her society. For now, though, most scholars seem to agree that the burial represents the first genetic proof that Viking women could be warriors. Early Trigonometry the ancient Greeks are widely credited with inventing the foundations of modern trigonometry, but a recent study suggests that the Babylonians may have used it 1,500 years earlier. The research examined a strange series of numbers on an ancient clay tablet fragment known as Plimpton 322 created in ancient Mesopotamia between 1822 and 1762 BC, the bizarre artifact has perplexed experts ever since its discovery. In 1945, researchers said that the tablet appears to contain evidence of a primitive form of trigonometry, but until recently, that's as close as they got to figuring it out. As part of the new study, Australian mathematician Daniel F. Mansfield sought to prove his theory that this type of math was developed for marking the boundaries when ownership of private property first came into practice. He found answers in Psi 427, a tablet that was made in Iraq sometime between 1900 and 1600 BC. It describes the sale of a plot of land and contains extremely precise information about its boundaries. Coupled with Plimpton 322, it appears as though the Babylonians developed geometry for creating accurate perpendicular lines. Mansfield backed up his claims with support from cultural texts, including a description of a senior scribe scolding a junior scribe for calculating dimensions improperly. See? Just like school today! While Mansfield's hypothesis remains unproven, it presents a solid argument justifying more research into the possibility that the Babylonians preceded the Greeks with their mathematical developments. If this happens to be the case, then it would attribute the beginnings of trigonometry to an entirely different culture and set its origins back over 1,000 years. First Nocturnal Dinosaur Around 65 million years ago, a strange genus of theropod dinosaurs called Shuvuya roamed the desert in what is now Mongolia. These creatures came from the same group of dinosaurs that gave rise to modern-day birds. The only known Shuvuya species is Shuvuya deserti, which means desert bird. It was about half the size of a chicken with long legs, a fragile skull, and powerful arms equipped with single claws. Scientists have long known of the species' existence, but they only recently realized that it may have been the first dinosaur to hunt at night. A team member noticed that the creature's lagina, an organ that processes hearing, was unusually long. The team compared the species with CT scans of around 100 living birds and extinct dinosaurs. They also measured each species' scleral rings, which are the bones surrounding the pupils, to determine which animals were more likely to have operated in low light. They were surprised to learn that the barn owl, a nocturnal species with excellent hearing, was the only creature with a comparably long lagina to the Shuvuya. The Shuvuya's scleral ring was large in diameter, meaning it let in a lot of light and perhaps enabled the animal to hunt in the dark. The creature's remarkable hearing helped it locate burrowing insects and small mammals. Then, it seized its prey by digging in one of its two large, singular claws. Several of the Shuvuya's traits, including nocturnal activity, digging ability, and long hind limbs, are also seen in modern-day desert animals. The team also learned that most dinosaurs were primarily daytime creatures, and that predatory dinosaurs typically had good hearing compared to most birds. Mediterranean Whales Killer whales, also called orcas, are not known to frequent the Mediterranean today. In fact, not many whale species, period, are typically seen in the region, and none are known to breed there. Yet around 2,000 years ago during the first century, Pliny the Elder wrote about killer whales hunting whale calves near the Strait of Gibraltar. 
shelter. He described how the orcas viciously slaughtered mothers and their young in the Bay of Cadiz. Because there are no killer whales in that area today, some researchers assumed that Pliny was mistaking dolphins for orcas. But a 2018 study suggests that he may have been spot on with his observations. The research describes the discovery of bones belonging to North Atlantic right whales and Atlantic gray whales, which were found among the ruins of an ancient Roman fish processing facility along the Strait of Gibraltar. Unearthed in the ancient Roman city of Baelo Claudia near modern-day Tarifa, Spain, the evidence fits almost perfectly with Pliny's claims. Now, experts wonder if the Romans hunted whales, along with the tuna and other large fish they were known for harvesting. Ancient fishermen didn't have the technology to hunt large whales on the open sea, but they may have taken advantage of the opportunity to kill them while they were close to shore, according to lead study author Ana Rodriguez. She further explained that the study shows how even heavily studied regions still contain surprises from the past leaving one to wonder what else has been lost to history, or perhaps is still waiting to be discovered in places like the Mediterranean. The Aragonese The Aragonese people once dominated northeastern Spain. The Kingdom of Aragon had its own language, and they were a force to be reckoned with in the Middle Ages. The Aragonese built some pretty incredible monuments in the region around Congos de Montrebay. This part of Spain is beautiful and largely uninhabited today with only a few of this ancient culture's fortifications still dotting the landscape. There is a medieval stronghold here that dates back to 1070. It once guarded the gorge moving through the land. There are also hermitages, with one of them having a rather unique story. The story says that in the small town of Chiriveta, the statue of the Virgin was found every morning outside of the temple as if moving on its own. It was happening every single day, and the locals realized that the Virgin was asking for a new hermitage. So, a second one was built in the exact location that the Virgin kept appearing each morning. But years later, it turned out that there was no miracle at all. Instead, it was the priest of the hermitage, who was tired of having to go all the way to work on bad roads. He invented the story so that a new hermitage would be built closer to his house, so he wouldn't need to walk as far. In any case, the Aragonese are still around today. The Kingdom of Aragon was actually the foundation for what eventually became the country of Spain, though their culture as a whole is no longer a dominating force. The Austronesians of Madagascar The Austronesian people are extremely interesting because they don't live in just one part of the world. They are also still around today, though not in the same way they were thousands of years ago. Austronesian people include populations in Madagascar, Micronesia, New Guinea, Polynesia, and even Taiwan. Austronesian people are descendants of a single people who migrated out across the sea in little boats, spreading themselves as far as possible. They actually started in Taiwan before the Chinese Han ever made it to the island. This was sometime around 3000 BC, or roughly 5000 years ago. It's hard to say anything about their history before that, but we know they started in Taiwan. From there, they took boats and made it all the way to the Philippines in 2200 BC. The Austronesians were the first people to invent sailing technologies that allowed them to traverse the ocean. They used catamarans, outrigger boats, and even invented the crab claw sail. By the year 2000 BC, they had either assimilated themselves or had been assimilated by people in Indonesia, Easter Island, Madagascar, and New Zealand. They were basically in a position much like England during the Golden Age of Exploration, when they were creating colonies all over the world. The Austronesians did it before them, landing in places like Tonga, Hawaii, Singapore, and spreading into Southeast Asia. It's not so much that this ancient culture vanished, but that they were absorbed by dozens of different cultures. Today, there is not really much direct trace of the 5,000-year-old explorers left as they've blended so seamlessly with so many other peoples and cultures. The Grand Canyon Civilization The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long, meaning there is plenty of room in this natural wonder for mysteries. And one of the biggest mysteries surrounding the Grand Canyon is that there very well could have been an underground civilization living here hundreds, even thousands of years ago that we barely know anything about. The thing about the lost civilization of the Grand Canyon is that it's currently just a myth. 
The story began in 1909, when an explorer, allegedly with the Smithsonian Institution, found caverns in the Grand Canyon filled with artifacts. The explorer was G. E. Kincaid, working with anthropologist S. A. Jordan. Inside the caverns, they discovered granaries full of seeds, ancient copper weapons, and curious statues unlike anything ever found in the Americas. Plus, the size of the caverns suggested that people could have lived inside, up to 50,000 people comfortably. But what kinds of artifacts did they actually find? The experts thought they looked Egyptian. It made them believe that there had once been an ancient civilization of Egyptians, or at least Egyptian-like people, thriving in the Grand Canyon. But that doesn't make sense because the Egyptians had no way to reach the Grand Canyon. They had no way to reach America, never mind Arizona. We still don't know the truth about what actually happened here. All of the artifacts have vanished. The Smithsonian denies that there ever were artifacts to begin with. And plus, there are some awfully suspicious places in the Grand Canyon that are completely off limits to civilians. So, what's going on here? The Death of Ancient Egypt Speaking about ancient Egypt, not many people understand that ancient Egypt crumbled and died just like every other major culture in history. Like the Romans, the Babylonians, Egypt declined both as an economic and political force and was wiped out. But with ancient Egypt, the decline was slow and painful. Between the years 1069 and 653 BC, Egypt was having a hard time. They had a bit of a renaissance in which religion, art, and architecture were all restored, but they were having difficulties with the Assyrians. By 671, Assyria had successfully conquered Egypt. They installed native Egyptian rulers to keep the population peaceful. There were a few rebellions from pharaohs trying to retake parts of Egypt, but none of them succeeded. What's really interesting about what the Assyrians did is that they almost brainwashed Egypt and turned the country into their pet. By 609 BC, when the Assyrians were being beaten on all sides by the Babylonians, the Medians, and the Scythians, the Egyptians actually stepped up to try and save them, though they were unsuccessful. Once the Assyrians were gone, the Persians captured Egypt. This went on until 332 BC, when Alexander the Great took over. There was a very nice period of peace between Alexander the Great and when Egypt became a Roman province. The Romans were extremely vicious, spreading Christianity, closing down Egyptian temples, and essentially attempting to erase all aspects of the rich history and culture of the native Egyptians. And this would be the final straw for ancient Egypt. They continued to speak Egyptian, though all of their heritage was gradually forgotten. The Clovis Culture the North American Clovis culture migrated into South America about 11,000 years ago and then later vanished without a trace. In a new study, researchers have taken a look at DNA from 49 people living over the past 10,000 years. They took this DNA from skeletons found in Belize, Brazil, and the Central Andes. And what they found was that many people were genetically linked to the Clovis people, and yet they haven't found a single artifact of the Clovis in South America. According to Nathan Nakatsuka at Harvard Medical School, he wasn't really expecting to find a relationship between the Clovis and the ancient people of South America. And yet it seems that the Clovis moved into Central and South America and continue to spread, having children and perhaps intermingling with those around them, even as they left their culture behind. But who were the Clovis to begin with? They were the first migrants who crossed the Bering Strait from Asia into North America 15,000 years ago. They traveled in at least three major migration groups, then slowly began to spread across North America. But what's strange is that about 9,000 years ago, the Clovis mostly vanished and were replaced by unknown people with unknown genetic ancestry. Scientists are still trying to figure out what happened to the original migrants, why and how they made it all the way into South America, and who took their place in the North. The Silurian Hypothesis the Silurian hypothesis suggests there may have been a complex culture living on the planet before humans ever existed. Forget about the ancient Egyptians, forget about Mesopotamia, because we're going back millions and millions of years. You might think that if there had been advanced civilizations before humanity, they would have left some trace of themselves behind. But that's not necessarily true. It really depends on just how advanced this mysterious civilization was and what kind of things they built. For example, in 100 million years, 
scientists will still be able to see that humans manipulated the soil to feed billions of people. They will also find plastic all around the world for millions of years to come. There is a very little chance that a civilization as destructive as our own ever existed. If anyone else had polluted the world like this, we would already know about it because that kind of evidence doesn't go away. But it is possible that there had been a primitive society that didn't advance beyond, let's say, the medieval period. It's also possible that they could have been a race of strange creatures, more like lizards than humans. Even if they had been around for 100,000 years, that would still be 500 times longer than our own industrial civilization. And if they had built palaces of stone and brick 2 million years ago, there would be absolutely no trace of these structures left today. In any case, scientists say it is possible there was an advanced civilization of creatures living on Earth, but that all evidence has been wiped away. What do you think about this theory? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. The Toalians The Toalians are an absolute mystery to scientists. So far, we've only actually discovered one skeleton that belonged to these curious people. It happened back in 2015 when archaeologists from the University of Hasanuddin, located on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi, found the skeleton of a woman buried deep in a limestone cave. The woman was only about 17 years old when she died 7,200 years ago. She's the only physical example of a Tolean person ever found. You're probably wondering how scientists could possibly know by a single skeleton that there was a whole culture of mysterious people. The thing is that the Austronesians, the people I told you about earlier, spread into Indonesia 3,500 years ago. This means that whoever this girl was lived around 4,000 years before that happened. It means that there was a culture of Neolithic people living on Sulawesi before anybody else showed up. It's just that scientists have never been able to find more of their bones or other remains. So far, they've only found artifacts as evidence of this ancient culture, mostly things like arrowheads and stone tools in caves. The Giraft Culture The settlement of Shar e Sokta appeared in the Bronze Age 3,200 years ago. The entire city covers an area of 151 hectares, making it one of the largest on the planet at the beginning of the urban era. It also has one of the biggest graveyards ever found with 40,000 ancient graves still hiding beneath the sand. But what's interesting about this city is that it belonged to an independent Bronze Age civilization called the Giraft culture. These people were located between the Elam people to the west and the Indus Valley civilization to the east. And yet they had nothing to do with the other, arguably much greater and more influential powers. They governed themselves, had their own architecture, unique language, and their own specific beliefs. We just don't know what a lot of their beliefs were because the Giraffe culture disappeared in 2100 BC. Their sudden vanishing came after the great city of Shar e Sokta burned down three times. Their city burned to the ground and then was rebuilt three different times before they finally gave up and abandoned the place. It's for this reason that archaeologists call it the Burnt City. When the Giraffe culture left, nobody really knows where they went or what happened to them. They may have integrated into some other nearby culture or simply faded away into history. The Civilization at Cacaxtla There was once a civilization in Mexico even more mysterious than the Maya. To understand these people, we need to look at the archaeological site of Cacaxtla. It's not a very popular place when compared to spots like Chichen Itza, but it's almost more interesting because it was once the home of a civilization called the Olmeca Xicalanca. Archaeologists and historians have been puzzling over these people for decades. They were probably related to the Maya, but they had their own uniqueness about them. They dominated small parts of central Mexico around the 5th century and then disappeared for a few hundred years before popping back up in the late 8th century during the fall of Teotihuacan. Nobody knows exactly where they came from, though there is one theory that says they came from the Gulf of Mexico. British archaeologist John Eric Thompson believes they may have started as Mayan merchants, but gradually became their own self-governing civilization who built their own city. Then, when Teotihuacan fell, they rose up to take advantage of the power vacuum. They settled in Cacaxtla and survived all the way until the 12th century, 
when they were conquered by the Chichimecas. The few survivors went to live in Tabasco, where some bloodlines may even survive today. The Seleucid Empire The Seleucid Empire lasted for roughly 300 years. It was established around 312 BC by Seleucus I Nicator, one of the last generals of Alexander the Great. When Alexander died in 323 BC, he didn't leave anyone to take care of his kingdom. Instead, he said that all of his empire should go to the strongest man among them. This resulted in serious conflict between all of Alexander's top generals, including Seleucus and Ptolemy I Soter. And while some went on to rule parts of Egypt and other pieces of Alexander's quickly fracturing empire, Seleucus went on to do his own thing, merging east and west more successfully than Alexander ever did. In the first days, the Seleucid Empire was tolerant of all cultures and religions. There was efficient bureaucracy, trade was flowing, and so was the money, and they continued to expand using military campaigns. They at one point stretched all the way from the Mediterranean Sea to the Indus Valley, but the decline came soon enough for these people. After about 150 years, the original vision of Seleucus I became lost. There were three kings ruling the empire between 163 and 145 BC, each more concerned with their own position in government than actually governing. As you can tell, not much has changed in the past 2,000 years. The last king of the Seleucids died in 63 BC after a reign of just two years. His name was Philip II Philoramus, and he desperately tried to maintain his position while the empire fell apart all around him. Though by now, the empire wasn't much more than a small colony in Syria, holding on to a name that used to mean a lot more. Thanks for watching! Which of these vanished people do you think is the most fascinating? Let me know in the comments below, and be sure to subscribe and browse our massive selection of other great videos. See you soon! Bye!